and the, the sex with him. Yeah. The program contains scenes of drug taking and strong language. Okay, yeah, don't worry about that. Yeah. What time? By tonight. Right. Um, I'll get... Yeah. Um, I'll, be, I'll be around at 7.30, yeah? Drug dealing right. is a thousand times more addictive than um, drug taking. You now, you start off by... Just being an ordinary run of the mill Joe, you know, you're doing an ordinary nine to five, and your tipple is cocaine. And cocaine is very, very expensive. Yeah. Because you're always running back and forth to this same geezer, seeing him with wads of money and Christ knows what else, you think to yourself, well, I'll buy a little ape and sell that on, and I'll make the money for mine. You tell a few people this week that you, you're selling it. You get your couple of grams for nothing. And then you buy a quarter and then it goes so on to... Um, you end up buying half ounces and an ounce of Charlie. And it doesn't take a couple of months before you're making five, six, seven, eight hundred pound a week and getting a load of it for yourself. From becoming an ordinary run-of-the-mill Joe, you've now turned into someone that's earning more money uh, selling cocaine than you was flipping burgers in McDonald's, you know, for £200 a week. And your head will not allow you to work from nine to five for five and a half days a week and take home £250 when on Saturday night in the corner of the nightclub you can go and earn yourself a grand. Right? And, and with all the parties you start getting invited to, you know, you're missing days at work, it's hard to get up, so you just retire from the, your day job, which is peanut money, and you now become not in your own eyes, all right? but you now become, in the police's eyes, a professional criminal. You know, you are earning your sole income from crime, you know, from Class A narcotics. I'm a fucking dealer. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> really? A dealer, you know, you could be a dealer, couldn't you? I could be a dealer. Any of these guys could be a dealer. Yeah. Well, it's a pyramid. What you've got is you've got the guy at the top brings the gear into England. Below him you've got the guy who then distributes it to sort of everyone around England and blah blah blah. It just filters down. So you've got your foot soldiers going round, you know, selling it in the pubs and clubs and all that sort of shit. And then it's just like a pyramid. It just filters out to people chopping it out, you know what I mean? Pyramid selling is the most efficient method of distributing a product to a range of people at, at a community level. And this is exactly what cocaine dealers and other dealers are now involved in, a form of pyramid selling, where the people who are the most visible and most likely to be apprehended are just those at the bottom of the pyramid, and they're the most easily replaceable. And the people who are actually doing most of the business above them, the wholesalers and the importers, are very rarely caught. You've got the top man 
you've got the trusted lieutenants, so to speak, and below them, people who stash for them, people who fetch the drugs for them, people who move the drugs from the stashes to the people who are actually going to do the street dealing, the handing over to the customer. I know most of the uh, dealers in Derby. Uh, well, I think I do. I, there's probably a lot that I don't realise are, but I, I know probably two or three hundred dealers in Derby. I got into it in a bit of a bizarre way, really. I had a car. This geezer used to come down to Kilburn <coughs> every week. And he didn't have a car, he just needed a lift. So what had happened is I'd sort of, you know, just give him a lift down, he'd go and sort his shit out, and I'd go and have a meal, have a pint, go and watch a film, whatever, and we did that for about a year. And then, um, I kind of got into it. Um, and he trusted me after a year. And he sort of, you know, everything was cool, and I met the guys who turned out to be these Irish guys. And what, actually, what that meant was that all the money, which apparently is a big sketch with them, um, you know, Kilburn, Kentish Town, Camden, all that sort of shit, that all the money is going back to the IRA, which kind of freaked me out a bit, you know what I mean? But I stuck with him for quite a while. You do them funny, you know, but the only place they get them from you know, they do a bit better than that. Basically, you know, it just goes, it's every night. Yeah. But I give it, you know, the girls like it, they know they can rely on me, and that's it, they love it. They all get into it. So this is going to loosen me up a bit, isn't it? Yes. Oh, you'll hopefully be fine. better you'll than last night, then. You'll be wowing them once you have this, dear. So is this a free one, or? This is a free one. If you like it, you can get some, yeah? All right. You know, you do coke because it's going to, you know, give you that extra bit of life, yeah. Because after a while, you know, it's all right, you start off doing this job and you have a few drinks and you're like, well, hey, let's go, and that's enough for a while. But then, you know, time goes on and, you know, you get used to it. You don't have the gift of the girl anymore. You're not going around dizzy drunk anymore. So you just need that extra little kick to get you back into things again. And, you know, obviously I tried and lied and I thought, Actually, yeah, this works, so just went for it, and then obviously it gets a bit out of hand, and now I'm sort of dishing it out to the other girls so that I can, you know, keep myself in it without having to dish out too much money. People become users, then they become addicts, then they become distributors, and then they see that they can cover their own addiction by dealing, and that they then work their way up the chain. The problem with cocaine is just... As a dealer, you kind of, all the time, you're kind of riding a tiger. You, you, you know, there's no, it's difficult to sort of say, be sensible, because you're not being sensible anyway. If you're not touching it at all, you're going to find it very difficult to put the hours in. Because like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the mobile phone's going, the page's going, that phone's going, this phone's going. Either you're giving stuff out to people, or you're riding around, handing it to others, or your, your flat is just like Waterloo Station. But you, you're not, you can't just drop off in the afternoon. You've got to keep going. So nine times out of ten, they'll be using it themselves. And at certain points, they'll be using it a lot. So that clouds your judgment. It's not a good drug for judgment, uh, because you think you know everything. But yeah, this is what I do. Um, it's not a pleasant job. It's not a pretty job. But you know, it's purely business. It's not about, you know, it may look glamorous to some people. You know, I drive a nice car and all that, but basically, I don't really get to enjoy any of the luxuries of my particular occupation, you know what I mean? I spend a lot of time fucking worrying about people trying to, you know, dip me over. Can you come down? Can you do this? Can you bring a certain little piece of that? And I'm like, look, we've got an arrangement. We stick to it. That's that. People will be chopping and changing their minds all the time. Fucking ringing my mobile like I'm some kind of, you know what I mean, operator service or something. Because when you're out all night, bad things happen. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're funny, man. You're a funny rapper. There's glamour with drug dealing, isn't there? You're meeting all the right people, you know, and everyone wants to know you. I mean, I can, I can walk to the front of any nightclub queue whenever I want. Oh, that's cool. That's what you want, isn't it? You know what I mean? So there's no sad queuing. I must have 20 invitations a day for a party. You know, there's always stuff going on. And it's a glamour. You know, there's lots of nice women. 
you have a good time. You have a really good time. I don't see the point in getting up at 8 o'clock in the morning to go and fart around a photocopier for eight hours for 300 quid a week. Fuck that. No way, man. I just I do whatever I want. I'm my own boss, and I'm making a fortune. I've got a nice car, and I wear nice clothes, and I do whatever I want. What can be better than that? You take shit from people or you don't. Do you know what I mean? And the majority of society takes shit. Everyone goes to their job. Everyone works in a place where they hate going there in the morning. I've tried, I've, I've had a job. I've, I've done nine to five, do you know what I mean? I've had a situation where I get up, I get on the tube and I, I sit and I look across the, fa I look at all the people's faces and everyone looks miserable as fuck. And I said, do I really want to be like that? And I said, no, fuck that. I don't want to do that anymore. All you're doing is you're like, you're facilitating. You know, you've got people who want shit and you've got shit or you're the one who brings the shit in, do you know what I mean? You ring the dealer and you say, I want X amount and uh, he, he then arranges to meet you and you pay him the money. And then he tells you where to go and park and then he rings the courier. There will be some, probably in these cases, the 11, 12, 13 year old lads on pedal cycles and they ride along and, uh, and they go to the stash that they know about and, uh, and the dealer will probably have a lot of stashes and each courier will have their own one. But it's not so much of a risk for an 11 or 12 year old to uh, be caught with the uh, with drugs on them because uh, they're not they're very unlikely to get sent to prison whereas uh, an adult would be and you park up with your window down and you just sit there and eventually a kid will ride past on his push bike and chuck you your drugs through the window more so with cocaine than any other drug that the dealer tends to match um, the group of people that he or she is selling it to and i think that's um, partly because cocaine you know has cut across so many social groups in our society and seems to have found um, admirers in just about every section of society. Hello, mate. Um, sorry, listen, does, does Don have a mobile number? He doesn't. Yeah, that's not till later, though, is it? The middle class users in, in, in yuppie lifestyles and the entertainment world yeah, no, are much more likely to buy it off people from their own kind of background. Well, there's definitely a sort of James Bond element about it. Definitely. A sort of um, heightened senses. I mean, the whole, the whole thing surrounding um, this business, I think, is quite exciting uh, for the dealers and for the customers. Um, it's certainly more affordable now than it, than it used to be. Sea Bream's there? I mean, in the 70s, uh, a gram was, was 60 pounds, which of course, them was very expensive. And it's been one of the least inflationary products, I think, in the last 20 years. I mean, it's, it's stayed at 60 pounds all, all the way through. It's, it's never gonna be a great owner. It's never gonna be the sole income of my life. Um, I mean, I, I suppose there are, there are people who make a lot of money out of it, but I think they're much further up the chain than I am. If you were working in the bottom 40 to 50% of the distribution chain, you would be a very worried man. You would not be a happy shopkeeper that shut up his shop at five o'clock and went home and, and relaxed. Your job is to sell, to pass on, and to make a profit to pass back up the chain. I think that I'm a new breed of dealer. People don't think drug dealers have any sense. People don't think drug dealers have intelligence. People do not think that drug dealers know what the fuck that they're doing. And I know that there are some people that treat me like they think I'm stupid. I'm not stupid. I would not have this flat. I would not have the friends that I have. I would not have the clothes that I have. And I wouldn't know the people I know. I would not have those if I was stupid. I deal strictly to entertainment industry, the city, boys and girls. Um, lawyers, bankers, the, the higher echelons of, of society. Um, I'm very lucky that I deal to the who I deal to because I will always make more money than other dealers because the people I deal to have more money. It is an addiction there, I think. You get used to it and once you'll get used to having that sort of money, and it's easy money at the end of the day. It is easy money. Anyone could do it, really. Sometimes you feel like you're in a film almost, and, and it can be a situation where sometimes you, you're, you're like riding your own wave of publicity, 
Like you'll drive past a group of young people like this or something, and they'll all look at you and they just think like you own the place. Right. If you're dealing, right, look, if, if I take my client base, my customer base, these are the people who earn the money in this country. Um, they have an, a reputation and careers that could be destroyed if I wasn't discreet, if I wasn't clever, if I wasn't of their ilk, if I didn't... Basically, I could destroy lives by dropping them in it. They have so much more to lose than I could ever lose. You know, my worst fear is police and prison. Their worst fear is the end of their lives. You know, people think I'm just a drug dealer, so... But, you know, Miss Model and Mr. Actor and Mr. Lawyer and Mr. City Boy, that's the end of their lives. So I have a rep... I have, um... What's the word? A duty. That sounds really... You know, I have a duty to protect my clients, to show them respect, and in turn, they show me respect. If you'd seen some of the houses that I've been to, if you'd seen some of the places I've been because of what I do, you know, I, I've been able to create this kind of mini environment for myself, which I, I, I see that my clients have. And I think all my life I've wanted that, and this is, and, if, and dealing coke has got me that. There you go. Mm. Excuse me. Probably bring the bill now. Certainly, sir. Thank you. I supply the whole restaurant, and it's it's funny because I can I sit at this table and I look around the other diners, and I think they have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. That's fantastic. I love it. It's definitely a buzz. Anyway, when they, uh, when they bring me the bill, they bring it in, in a folder, and when I open up the folder, there's a, a wad of money inside the folder, which is uh, the payment. I then surreptitiously take that out, put it in my pocket, take out the product, put it back in the folder, close the folder, put it down on the table, leave. The waiter then just comes up, picks up the folder, and there you go. I'm saying, you know, maybe this will help if you're feeling nervous. I'm not saying you must take this to be able to dance. You know, I'm just saying, you know, it's your choice. Do you fancy it? And if they do, then they do. Wow. It's not pushing, is it? Is it? <laughs> no. No, I think it's all right. It's their choice. on the basis of there being um, at least one cocaine dealer for every 20 to 30 users, then we may be looking at um, something between uh, 10 and 20,000 individuals involved in cocaine dealing at some level in Britain you know, during any period of a couple of months. In any large city, there would be on any given day between 100 and 200 people selling cocaine at retail level. Uh, a few dozen people above them supplying them with the bags uh, to go out and distribute. And then in each city, maybe two or three large Mr. Bigs at the top, um, you know, governing the trade at a wholesale and sort of import level. No matter what the efforts of police and customs over the years, the, the, the price on the streets, I cannot recall it ever going up. In fact, in the case of cocaine, it's been steadily coming down. Now, we know that demand is going up because we've got ample research that shows more and more people are using it. Now, if demand is going up and price is going down, that means that supply is growing. We know that much about international market forces in any commodity. All the business is, is stark capitalism. That's all it is, because it's the same principles. Do you know what I mean? You're talking about profit and loss, 
you know what I mean? It's an economy. If you can organise a situation where you can maximise your profits and minimise your overheads or whatever, whatever, all it is is capitalism. And isn't that what this great country in the Western world is all about? How can you make the most money without losing the, you know, the less using the least labour? Now, this is not a business where in which the customer's always right. This is a business where I'm always right. It's as simple as. Because I am reliable, because my product is of a good quality, I'm kept very busy. Uh, there seems to be a niche in the market for a reliable dealer, um, someone who was reliable with punctuality and product. Um, and I felt I could give this service. It was amazing uh, how quickly it grew, actually. I do have another job, and I work in a business uh, where this product is quite widely used anyway. So it wasn't difficult for me to gently put the word about that it was available. And then it just grew from there. I haven't got any friends. I've got one friend, that's myself. Even though in this business you can be you can know someone for years and years and years and years. Donkey's years and they can still fuck you over, do you know what I mean? In a minute. Because like I said, everyone's out to rip everyone else off. First sign of fucking the old bill, 5 or whatever, they're gone and you're like, Whoa. and you're on your own. Don't turn your back. Don't turn your back, man. Do you know what I mean? I tend to think of myself as a, the sort of, not just a dealer, but a, a sort of a confidant. Um, I won't sell more than a gram. To, to a person. Um, I sort of look after them in a way. I mean, a gram a week is, uh, is about right. I mean, this is, there's, a, there's a, this sort of misconception about Coke as a sort of dangerous drug. I mean, I, I, I see myself like, like a publican in a pub. You know, I'm not gonna serve a drunk. So if a person has a cocaine problem, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sell them cocaine. But I don't really sell to, to people that I don't know. And, I, you know, if someone recommends someone to me, then I'll say, all right, cool. But you see, it's a situation now where, if, say, like, you say to me that this guy here is cool, and will I, will I get him a little piece of something? And then it turns out that either he's fucking undercover or he's just a dodgy character. You know, I'll, I'll, make, I'll, I'll make sure he gets fucked up, and then I'll make sure you get fucked up for introducing me to him. Do you see what I'm saying? I will let regulars. Um, have credit, um, but but in the same in the same way, I, I don't like people running up huge bills. I don't believe that's good for people to have so much debt. Um, so I, I won't I won't let people run up huge bills. And again, if there's a but you see, I mean, <laughs> if people don't pay, I, I'm, I'm not going to go around to their houses and beat them up. I mean. That there's never any question of threat. Our dealers have to go to the major towns to bring it in, and uh, that's good for us because that gives us the chance to catch them as long as the intelligence is right. You have it in a carrier bag or a glass jar or a, or Tupperware boxes are very good, and this would, this would be perfect. And all you do is you just pull the gas away. Put it under there, and then put the grass back, and that's it's, that's where it is. Nobody would notice anything. You could walk past there, and you'd never see it. It's dry under the grass, uh, and uh, you put it in glass or um, or Tupperware because you don't want mice chewing through your plastic bags. You don't want to, to lose any stuff to uh, wild animals. And then you just describe the dis distance from the lay-by or or the particular tree. It's at the angle of the fence and where the fence meets. Uh, the tree that's been cut down. Now, if, if we find that, we've got a choice of either seizing it or waiting for somebody to come and pick it up. But uh, uh, the person who put it there, if we find it, would get a beating because he's either grassed them up or he's been incompetent. So he's, he takes the blame for that. And they, all, they always like to have somebody to blame all the way along the chain because it, it makes you feel better if you've lost a fair amount of money's worth to, to uh, give someone a bit of a punishment for it. If you're working with me, and I'm going to bring you a little piece of something, then basically you're going to get top quality shit. And always top quality shit. I'm not going to give you anything but that. Primarily because, you know, that's how people get fucking shot up and killed and all that shit. Do you know what I mean? You've got idiots who are thinking about, you know, ripping people off left, right and centre. So they're selling dodgy shit. You know what I mean? You know, two, three weeks later, 
you're at home, you're in bed with your wife or your kids or whatever, and the fucking police are kicking in your door, and you're wondering why is that the situation? It's, pretty, it's plain and simple as far as I'm concerned, yeah? You fuck someone over selling them dodgy gear, they're not going to think twice about selling you out to the old bill. You know what I'm saying? Go down there. No, don't even go down there. But have you noticed, and the more, and the more I do, the worse I get. Yeah. No, I got that. Is that a naked lady no, no. or a it's naked, a naked man. man? Oh, I think it's both. It's, really <laughs> it's, it's the old half and half. Exactly, exactly, exactly. No, have you seen a man? I was actually thinking of getting every one of these for Christmas. I mean, Christmas pre Christmas present. Yeah, yeah, for the Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> Filthier the better, as far as I can see. Which is a bit funny. Always shocked. It kind of adds that little element of, of shock to it. I have to say that the, if the people that I deal to knew the people I get the stuff from, they're worlds apart. Um, I shouldn't say this really, but. The people I get it from don't have any class. Um, and the aggression and the violence there is, you know, I've, I've got to be respectful to my clients and I've got to be respectful to the people I get what my clients need from. I know there are many links to the chain, but the only link I really have any dealings with is the guy just uh, immediately above me who supplies me. There are two ways we meet. Either I go to his house, which can be difficult because uh, they've just installed security cameras on his road. Uh, so that's a little dodgy now. But um, we have this arrangement uh, to meet at this railway station. We both carry the same sort of, um, actually they're computer cases that we live in. Obviously mine has the money in, his has the product in. And the next train arrives, I pick up his computer case, get on the train. And I don't know what happens after that. I think the, the threat comes if, if, if you buy things on tick, if you're given the product um, and then you have to sell it and then you have to give them, them the money, then I think there could be problems there. When I get uh, the product from my supplier, I give him the money there, there and then. So there's, there's never any problem. He gets the money, I get the product. We're both happy. I mean, if, you, if, if everyone's keeping each other happy, then no problems can arise. So the way I deal is problem-free in that respect. I, I don't need problems. I don't, I'm in this for the fun of it. I don't, I don't want problems. I want a club, I will take that club by whatever means is necessary. Whatever means. <laughs> Certainly if you glance back at the tail end of the 60s and the 70s, proper respected criminals had nothing whatsoever to do with drugs. They looked down their nose at this up-and-coming industry and the youth culture of the time. When I was a kid, I used to read books, look at books, gangsters and I always wanted to be a gangster. Always wanted to be a gangster. This is what I wanted, you know, all this, 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 I love it. The traditional armed robbers and, and their extended families, you will see their names cropping up in the drugs field now. I've been in more pockets than a cost of a little pocket. <laughs> You're going to lose, mate. I'll never lose. That's my motto. I'll never lose. If you don't like it, I'll burn your club down, I'll set, I'll set about you, I'll set about your wife, whatever. That's the way it is. What you gotta do? You gotta do it. You, in this business, you've either got to be you got to be, be hard, you've got to have a reputation, you've got to be ruthless. You know. <laughs> There's three indicators of a thriving market, and that is the purity, the price, and the availability of the product. Both the price and the purity suggest a thriving market. And when we turn to availability, our surveys show that young people say it's more available now than it ever was before. 
for the first time ever in the last few years, we've seen a youth market developing in cocaine. It's grown from perhaps 1% of the 15 to 25 year olds, and, and now the indicators are showing 6% using cocaine. Now that's a frightening growth in a short period. This is the sort of growth in the use of cocaine that the Americans have seen 20 years ago, and we feared would arrive then, but it didn't. And now we've got it coming in, but it's coming in demand-led, and the demand-led mechanisms are being taken over by the suppliers so that it's now going to be production and importation led and that's a dangerous changeover <laughs> you can get half a gram for what, 25 if you know so you've got you've got a mate you get it for 20. we do things on bail right somebody will come to me they want to buy a key 25 grand for a key right i will give that to them on bail they've got two weeks to pay they'll take they take it away they cut it with whatever they cut it with then they've got their two weeks to sell it and bring me the money because it's all done on pay me when it's done. That's where the violence comes in around the drug industry because people end up taking their own supply and they've got it on tick and they give it to someone else on tick and then he gets arrested with it and then he has to explain to the man upstairs, you know, I haven't got it because he's got nicked and the bloke says, well, I'm not interested where it is after it left you, I gave it to you, you know, you owe me a grand. And that happens all the way up the line to hundreds of thousands of pounds. <laughs> When you do bail and you take a big consignment of someone's stuff, as soon as you take it, you are liable. You could walk out of there and walk straight into the old bit and they say, right, you're nicked and you've got the consignment and you still got to pay because there are people that have put money into it that need to be paid. And they ain't going to listen to what you've got to say. You've got to find it. So if you're good enough to come and get it off of, off of them on bail, right, get your skills together and go out there and earn the money now. Yeah, or get yourself deeper and say, give me another consignment and I'll work it up. And if anything happens to that, you know the hole is somewhere and it's waiting for you. So it's a dangerous game and there's a lot of people that don't realise what it's like and they go into it and before they know it, they're in too deep. The best thing for us is if uh, we bust somebody who's had, say, £10,000 worth of drugs on credit and we bust them with all those drugs, not only is he has he got the problem of uh, his court appearance, has also got the problem of repaying the, the major dealer is £10,000 and uh, that, that causes them as much problem sometimes as the court appearance and uh, although it sometimes provokes uh, a bit of violence if they don't pay up. That quicksand, you're in it and, and as soon as you take your consignment or as soon as you start thinking this is what I want to do or this is what I need to do, you know, you're on a one-way ticket. <laughs> if I'm going to be doing it all the time, I'm not going to be a good coke dealer. A, I'm going to be using what I'm selling. So I'm going to be using, I'm not going to be making any money, I'm going to get myself into debt. I'm going to be out every night, off my face. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to be, I'm going to be in bed till four o'clock recovering from the night before and the ways of selling are going to be completely erratic. You know, so I'm untrustworthy. I see people coming around here and buying loads and loads and buying three, four grams and going out and caning it. I wouldn't do that, you see. All I do is I just sort of go out and I just perk myself up a little bit, do you know what I mean? I just, three, four lines, just keep myself cheeky. That's all I do, you know. You gotta be careful, you know? Yeah. I like that line. They're hooked financially, they're hooked medically, and, and they're hooked because they can't get out, because they've also got information, both above and below, and they can't drop out of the chain and suddenly go and lie in the sun. The drug eventually makes you, you know, completely paranoid. You know, the day after a heavy night, you know, you just mull it up, you don't know what you've been up to the night before, you haven't got a clue, you know, your head's not thinking. But it's a business as well, you know. I'm dealing with nasty people sometimes. You know, nasty, nasty people who I've got to... They give me a load of Charlie. The next week I've got to go back with one and a half grand. So I've, I've got to sort that out. I've got to knock that out. You know, so it's never my money. It's always coming in and going out. Do you know what I mean? <coughs> so, it's not my money. I know, it's just, I love the money, it's the fucking money. That's what it's all about, is having money, and I love that. I love the money, I love spending money. And um, I like the authority, I get a buzz from that. 
Who owes me some money then? Not me for once. Yeah, see ya. Nah. Not only does the dealer not know if the person he's supplying is an undercover police officer with a view to being arrested, but he's got no idea whether he's transgressing the boundaries onto another dealer's area. He's got no idea whether the person he's selling to is trying to set him up with a view to being robbed. The market is turned. It's, it's, it's a mistrustful, a dangerous and a frightening market. You've just got to keep watching yourself and, and know where you are and know what you're up to and, and you know. <laughs> it's a scary fucking business. It's a scary business. If you think at the basis of all this, we're an island. We're an island that imports lots of commodities. We have seaports and airports that every single day are bringing in both people and goods. In amongst them, there's a large quantity of drugs. It would bring this country to a complete halt if every consignment of legitimate cargo had to be stopped, searched and examined by customs officers in order to ensure that there was no cocaine present. We therefore have had, over the years, internationally, to develop more sophisticated methods uh, to match the smugglers and to focus on consignments of greatest risk. Export, import, that's the business I'm in. The difficult part of it is making sure that you've got the right connections in Colombia and you're not dealing with the, the uh, authorities, you know, which is, a, that's, that's the biggest problem now because they're fucking smart. From there, it's very easy to get it out the country. Then it'll come through to, it might come to Spain, uh, Portugal, one of those places, and that's pretty easy to get it into that country as well. Now, you put your money up front six months ago, but there's a lot of return on it, you know. Right away, you get it into this country, the value's quadrupled. I'm a company director. Um, and the company goes right down. We've got lots and lots of people. Every one of them's got to be trustworthy. Um, and it only takes one person to fuck it up. I've been doing this for X amount of years. I've never had any trouble with people bubbling us. And that takes some doing, because that's the usual fucking way you get caught. Most people get caught by telling people about it. They just don't do it for the money. They want to be getting the money out and showing uh, what they've done so that they're a big, you know, and everyone, everyone's listening to it. They're fucking liabilities or people who, who, uh, who use it, who indulge in it. You know, you get some young kids and they're flash and they've got lots of balls and they'll do things, not scared of anything. I've always been scared. If you're not scared, anyone who says they're not scared is fucking lying or else they're stupid and you do not want to get involved with people like that. Uh, do you know the risks and you go, yeah, I understand, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, fuck it, I'll do it. They must be scared. They're scared of us catching them because the penalties are up to life imprisonment. They're scared of us being able to latch on to their part of the organization where we're able to confiscate all the assets and the profits that they have made. The most dangerous thing, you see, if we've been nobbled right from Colombia, if they fucking know, they're not going to pull us there because they want the people at the other end, i.e. people like me. Um, so they want to come down, they want to fucking get everyone. They will leave it and leave it and leave it. And that's all I did. That's their undercover stuff, you see, and they are fucking good at it. But I know the risks and you've got to be prepared to take the risks. The price is going down. That means that more is coming in. We know from international models 
that the, the size of the drug market is equal to the, the entire world market in tourism. Now, that's horrendous. If you, if, if you thought for an instance of the criminals taking over some of the London hotels, you'd be frightened to death. In a container, it would be quite possible to conceal anything up to four or 500 kilograms of cocaine. Cocaine has the advantage, from the smuggler's point of view, of being soluble, and therefore we've often found seizures of cocaine, which in fact has been dissolved in liquid uh, and smuggled in that way. You've got to run it like a military operation, you know. The consignment has arrived, it's cleared customs, and it's in Portsmouth. A team of people are involved in getting that back to the safe house. Safe house be in this area. Immediately it's in place, some people will go there, and their job is to sit there with surveillance equipment, they're listening and they're watching to see if, there's any, see if it's got any interest, see if there's any heat around there, OK? A driver will de be dispatched, and he'll be driving a van down. It might even have some, some, some other goods in it. And behind him, another car will fall. Providing there's been no one sniffing around, the driver will know it's OK to go in. It will be loaded up. But on the way back, the dangerous stuff is now he's in possession of it. He's actually got it. And once they get to a certain standing or have a certain amount of money, uh, then they don't go and fetch the drugs themselves. They, get, they pay other people to take the risks. And uh, uh, they don't actually pay that much, considering uh, the risks that some people take. I think if you're a drug dealer, and most of them work on the principle that they're being followed every day, or they're being listened to every day, or they're being watched every day, and then they're taking all the right precautions every day. Two people are going ahead, your van driver will go, and then you've got your backup team. They'll pull in at two service stations, and these are checkpoints. Because what you've got to do is, when that man pulls out, you've got to watch what cars follow it out. Do you see? And how long they stay with it. If all of that is secure, it'll drive into a warehouse. And that warehouse will have a front door and a back door. It'll drive into that warehouse, the doors will be pulled down, secured. It will then exit that warehouse and be taken off to another place. And it'll be in a lock-up garage. And there it'll stay for a week, maybe more. And whilst that time, there'll be a 24-hour watch on it to see if anything comes sniffing around. Anyone comes sniffing around or anything that looks a bit dodgy, and we leave it. We just leave it. There's, there's no... You don't take risks. How do you think I feel? You beat them. It's there. You've gone through all that. You've gone through, like, six months of worry and all that. And from when it arrives in this country, particularly from when he gets it in that van, then you're twitching. That's when you're buzzing. I mean, fuck, you know, I, I, I'll go 48 hours and won't sleep. And I'm not greedy. I won't have four big deals going on or let's have a bigger and bigger empire because your risk increases on each one. Do you know what I mean? And you can't go, well, I've done it three, four times. You thought it's like a boxer who's had, he's beat that guy three times so he doesn't train for the fourth fight and then he gets fucked. Do you know what I mean? Because he's, he's done it before doesn't mean, means you, you can never talk about what you're going to do. You say, yes, I've done that and it was successful then. You can do everything exactly the same, and you can fuck up. There are a number of deaths each year, the result of cocaine packages bursting inside human beings. The telephone rang at 9 o'clock. And uh, it was her, Michael. And I thought it was my mum at first, but it won't. I said, your twin is dead. So I said, well, what have you found? And they said, we found 13 balloons of co pure cocaine in his system. So at six o'clock, he rung me. He said, they finished the post-mortem. He said, they found a third, a further three, three balloons. So altogether, he had 16 balloons in his system. And what they'd done, see, the coroner said, that he didn't know how, how bad he had got him, but he had got him down his, down his throat because some of them was overfilled. 
So really it was a dummy run. And what they'd done, they cut the ends off of the balloons. And how he actually died is that, see, on the Friday night, he was drinking Diet Coke, which was the worst thing that you can do because it's got acid in it. So what it did, it filtered two nicks, one on one side and one on the other side. And when he was turning in his stomach, that's why he lived so long from me meeting him to him getting his head down at 12 o'clock that night. So all the pure cocaine was just dropping and dropping and dropping. So he was just getting higher and higher all the time. And he said, he said, he's just done, he just says, he just done killed him, he's blown his brains out as well. So he said he wouldn't have felt no. When you're twins, you've got that bond. And, like, you can always feel things feel if you if you if it were just your brother. And it just feels like something that you just lost your right hand. I mean he gave his life up for twelve thousand. Customs can't stop all the drugs coming into the country and likewise we can't stop all the drugs that are going to be sold so you, all you can do is try and keep a lid on it and then hope that uh, you get a generation of people that realise that they don't need all these different drugs to have a good time and, and hope that we gradually grow out of it but there's no great sign of that happening. They have to fight the battle against drugs but they are fighting a war that they cannot win. I've just made all this right happy, you know. I've made them happy, I've given them what they want. The industry now is so big, it's so financially rewarding, that there is nothing anyone can do to stop drugs coming into this country. Nothing. Well, this was a lad who did a run to Liverpool, uh, and we surveilled him and arrested him on the way back. He got amphetamine, which is the brown powder, he got cannabis, and he got uh, just about an ounce of cocaine, which is in, an interlock, but he, he wasn't considered to be a cocaine user and what, uh, a cocaine dealer. But he'd gone to the main dealers, he'd picked up what he normally picked up, and they'd said to him, we've also got some good cocaine, which uh, we want you to, or do you want to try and get rid of some? So he then brings it down, he starts offering it around, you get more people involved in using it. There was a guy, he used to hang around one of the um, advertising companies. He was doing all right there, but he suddenly got into to cocaine, he got into dealing. And the next time everyone saw him, he was in a brand new Merc. And then six months later, he had no, sh no shoes, he was begging. And a month after that, he was dead. You don't have to be selling tons of it to actually get seven years or 10 years. And if I was giving anyone advice, I would say, you just carry on buying it off the geezer under the stairs for 100 pound a week. Because to turn into a dealer, you are making a proper, proper mistake. You're going to get 10 years. And then it just, all, everything else just blows out the window, you know? The fact that you own a nice car in a garage outside while you're doing 10 years don't mean nothing, you know? And the bird that you've had for, like, 18 months and you've left your old woman for goes off with the next geezer that's fucking selling up to Charlie, you understand what I mean? And it's, um... Everyone thinks that their own hard luck story is very, very, um... individual for them, but it is a mass story, you know? There's millions of people falling into exactly the same trap, and in our position, we see them people all the time. The more you move up the chain, the more the pressure, the more the paranoia, the more the danger. There really is no way of stopping the distribution network because the people at the bottom are very replaceable. There's another hundred unemployed young guys waiting to take that retail level dealer's place when, when the police put him in prison. So what the police actually do is a sort of form of natural selection of cocaine dealers. They pull out the weakest and the worst and leave the strongest and the best and the most efficient to carry on.
Next week in a new series, Four is asking why the English have become ashamed of their nationality. That's White Tribe, starting next Thursday at 9 on Four. Next, he's forever young at heart and the man the girls love to play with. Stay with Four for an intimate portrait of world-class racing driver, Eddie Irvine.